Good morning, church family. It's good to, to see you all. It's great to be here in the house of the Lord on this Sabbath day, this last Sabbath in the month of April. And we are fast moving through the year 2023. Can't believe it, but here we are. And, uh, and we're going through it together. So that's, that's the good thing, no matter what we may be dealing with in life, we are a family, and, uh, and I, I appreciate you guys. You know, we're going to be starting a, a new sermon series uh, today and, uh, called The Beauty of Becoming. And uh, one of the things that all of us need to become is self-aware. Uh, self-awareness is not necessarily something we're born with. <laughs> uh, in fact, it's, it's easy to go through life, some people do, without ever truly being self-aware. Um, it isn't until about the age of four or five where, as a child, you, you can look into the mirror and realize that the person looking back at you is an actual person, right? Uh, that, that's, that's kind of the beginning of self-awareness. Um, but when it comes to like emotional and spiritual self-awareness, um, those can be elusive, right? They, they sometimes um, are difficult to achieve as as um, even as adults, like I said before. So when, when, we, when I'm talking about self-awareness, what am I saying? I'm, I'm saying when, when you're self-aware, you kind of understand your strengths and your weaknesses of your personality, and you clearly understand the motives behind your behavior. You've sat down and you've, you've looked at everything you do and you've analyzed why you do it, and uh, there's been some contemplation there whether or not um, it's something that best suits you or, or is helping you achieve your goals in life. So, so the sooner that you become self-aware, the sooner you become to, I would say, experience uh, your, your true purpose, your true meaning of life. Um, and, and the surprising thing about self-awareness, though, is that most people think they are pretty self-aware. Most people would say, yeah, I know myself. In fact, 95% of people actually, in a, in a study done by psychologist Tasha Eric for her book Insight, uh, considered themselves self-aware. But she found that the real number was nowhere near that. In a research, she said it was more around 10 to 15 percent of people at the most uh, have uh, achieved some level of self-awareness. Um, and, and most of us, probably about 80 percent of us, wake up every day and actually are living our lives on autopilot, right? We get up, we do, we, 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 we interact, we go to bed, and, and we're on this, this kind of cycle but we're not really deeply thinking about what we're doing or why we're doing it. Um, and, uh, and so this means we don't really understand why we react the way we do to certain things, why certain things really make us angry, why certain things really upset us, um, why, what certain things make us afraid. We, we, if we haven't done the work, we don't really know even ourselves. Um, but self-awareness is one of the best gifts you can give to yourself and especially the people around you. Because the more self-aware you are, guess what? The more compassionate you are. That's what I've found, right? Because you realize that everybody has their things just like you have your things. And the more you can understand why other people are the way they are, um, in, the, in context with, with yourself and your own self-awareness, um, you have a much more patience and compassion for other people, even though they may be different from you. Um, and so why, why is self-awareness so important for the Christian? Um, 
Well, because the only one who can truly give us self-awareness is God, right? Because he's the only one that truly knows who we are. Um, and, and, and the beautiful thing about God is he wants to give you that gift. He wants to give you the gift of, of a true self-awareness, of knowing who you are. And the best way to know who you are, of course, is in a connection and a relationship with him. Um, but until that comes, we tend to live on that treadmill of, you know, autopilot doing what we did last week, last year, 10 years ago. Probably not that much different. Paul said it too. He's like, hey, the things I don't want to do, those are the things I keep doing, and the things I don't, uh, the things I want to do, that's, that's what I don't do. So, you know, he, he talks about this, and, and, and it's like he's having this, you know, existential crisis here. He's like trying to figure out, you know, why am I the way I am? And his basic conclusion was, that sin was, you know, the, the, was causing his, his blindness to himself. Um, and, and so what we're going to be doing in this sermon series is really looking at these different steps that God has given us, that Christ has outlined for us in the Beatitudes about how we can grow in self-awareness, how we can grow in our relationship with Jesus, and the two actually go hand in hand. The more we understand ourselves in, the, in our relationship with Jesus, the, then our, our growth, it becomes exponential. So um, let's begin today with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity today to spend some time um, just reflecting on ourselves, Lord, and, and where we stand in your presence today, Lord. We, we want to grow. We want to become a better version of ourselves, but until we have that divine insight, until you open our eyes, uh, we are going to be blind to ourselves. We're going to be blind to the sin that controls us. We're going to be f- stuck, and we're going to continue the same cycles that um, were passed down to us from our parents and their parents, Lord, but we want to grow past those, Lord. So I pray that uh, today will be uh, an opportunity to, to reflect and that your spirit will teach us what we need to hear. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, when I was in college, I was introduced to this author, by the name of Andrew Murray. Uh, He was a contemporary of Ellen White. Actually, I think he was maybe a generation older than her. Um, Well, he wrote a lot of of books, but I think the best book or the classic that he wrote is a book called Simply Humility. So um, if you're looking for a free book that is uh, is amazing, you can download um, digitally for free, I would highly recommend Humility by Andrew Murray. Um, In the the beginning of the book, he has um, this to say about humility. Humility, the place of entire dependence on God, is the first duty of the creature and the root of every good quality. And, you know, what I was, when I read that, it, it really caused me to, to really take a second look at, at humility. You know, we talk a lot about humility, um, but understanding it as the root or the beginning of all the other good qualities that we achieve in Christ is, uh, is a profound thought. You know, the root of all the graces, the, the root of all the, the fruits of the Spirit, uh, the root of, of, a, of a life of love is, starts in humility. Now, if you read the, the Bible, of course, you know that we were all given this gift at creation. I mean, if you look around us today, uh, all creation kind of has this kind of openness to God. Um, and, and so what was it, of course, that changed that in humanity? 
Well, it was, it was believing the lie, the deception. And you know what the deception was. Of course, the serpent said to Eve that you will not surely die, right, if you eat the fruit. For God knows that if you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So we always come back to this because it's foundational when we study and try to understand ourselves. What, when we have to understand how we got off the right path. It, the lie here was, yes, you will not surely die, but there was a lie actually behind that lie. And the lie behind the lie was that since you can be God, you actually don't need God, right? And so the moment we decide that we don't need God, we have entered into a new um, phenomenon, a, a new principle that's opposite of humility. And you guys know the, the principle that's opposite of humility would be what? Pride, right? So pride was introduced the moment we believed the lie, the moment that we accepted the devil's altern alternate reality. Um, and so, so just as then that we saw that humility is the root of everything that is good, then pride must be what? Right? He says it in the same chapter. Murray continues, Likewise, pride, or the loss of this humility, is the root of every sin and evil. Man. So, so we, 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 we can base, we can, we can um, bring uh, salvation, those who are saved and those who are lost, down to these two basic principles, Right? Because we know that Christ exemplified in his life humility, right? That, that, was, that is who God is. God is humble. It's amazing. An all-powerful God, omnipresent, all-powerful, all-knowing. He's also humble, right? He's the one that gets down on his knees and washes your feet, He's the one who goes to the cross and dies for your sins, right? This is a humble God, right? A humble God who puts the needs of others above his own, right? Who's not afraid to, to uh, be interdependent. But we know that another power, another alternate to the one that God had set into motion was introduced through Satan, right? Right? And so the original sin was pride. And it's interesting because sometimes we, uh, we allow pride to go unrebuked sometimes, right? <laughs> but a lot of times it's because we're not self-aware, right? We're not aware that we're being prideful. So how do we grow in this understanding of what the difference between being prideful and or being humble? Well, Jesus, uh, what, this was one of the foundational teachings that, that when he started his Sermon on the Mount, and you can pretty much take Matthews 5, 6, and 7. If you just only had Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and that's all you studied, you'd have a pretty good indication of what it what it means to follow Jesus and be a disciple. I mean, it's like the whole Bible really just down in, in three chapters. But before you even begin the Sermon on the Mount, you have what we call the Beatitudes, right? And, uh, and the Beatitudes are my favorite. I love the Beatitudes. Um, and you're going to see why as we go through this series, because every sermon in this series, we're going to be focusing on one of these Beatitudes. So, obviously, we're going to start with the first beatitude, which is Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. And you know this, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, <laughs> there isn't something that is more simple than this in the Bible, right? I mean, we, we, sometimes we want to make salvation complicated, and it's only complicated because of how hard it is for us to 
accept it. <laughs> but when we, there, and this isn't the only verse that's super simple, but this is, this is one of my favorites because it, it's very simple because it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you are poor in spirit, according to this text, according to Jesus, yours is what? The kingdom of heaven. That means that you are saved. Amen? So if you are humble, if you don't think that, that you're all that, but you are dependent upon God, you recognize that you need him in your life, and you lift your heart up to him, guess what? You've just entered into salvation. The moment that you recognize your need of God in your life. God, I need you. Guess what? God shows up. He's right there. His hand reaches right out to you and grabs you. Wherever you are, he pulls you up. And friend, remember a couple weeks ago at Easter, we were talking about that ladder, right? Jesus is the ladder between heaven and earth. And I said, in that sermon, I said, it doesn't matter what rung of the ladder you're on, Guess what? When Jesus pulls that ladder up, everybody who's hanging on goes to heaven. Amen? You don't have to get to the top before Jesus comes. You just need to be on the ladder. And he'll pull everyone up together, all together. But guess what the first rung on the ladder is? It's right here. Humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You can't get on the ladder unless you're humble. It's the first step. You know, and, 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 and we understand this. If you've ever tried to overcome a compulsion or an addiction or behavior that, that was self-destructive in some way or hurting others around you and you were having a hard time stopping that behavior, right? Sometimes you join a group of other people who are trying to stop that same behavior, right? And, and, and we know that the only hope that you have of overcoming a behavior that is not desirable is by admitting, first of all, that you have the problem, number one, but number two is admitting that you are powerless, right? That you are completely incapable of managing this problem in your life. And, and uh, you know, in 12, grep, uh, excuse me, 12 step groups, um, use this basic principle of, of the first beatitude as, as part of the first three steps, right? Um, if, if you've ever been a part of a group, you'll know that they, they, most of them all have the same uh, wording for their 12 steps. We admitted we were powerless and that our lives had become unmanageable. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, and we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of a God as we understood Him. Right? So, why is this so important in recovery? Because until you get to the point where you realize, I can't do it, you're never going to find freedom. You're never going to find healing. But if it's true for recovery, how much more is it true for the Christian? Right? Because just because we can manage our sins a little better than others, does that make us better? Just because maybe we're not out of control, we're, we're, we're kind of a, a, a sinner that's kind of pretty good at, at covering up, covering our tracks, so we, we don't need help. I don't need to admit that, that, that sin in my life has become unmanageable. Hmm. Because if any sin is allowed to grow in our life, then I would propose to you that it's 
become unmanageable, right? If we're making an excuse for it to be there, then we are either in denial, like not self-aware, or we're just lying to ourselves. So it's either one or the other. But the reality is, is that, that Jesus wants us, we talked about this in the, in the child dedication of Hadassah, right? Jesus has to get us to the point where we recognize every need I have can only be met by you. Amen. When I try to meet my own needs, I, I, I get myself into trouble. I start doing things that I wish I didn't do, and I don't do the things that I know I should. Right? Because the moment we think that we can do it on our own is the moment that we're no longer living in humility, but we're living in pride. And there's not much God can do in our hearts when pride is the soil. But when humility is the soil, there's a lot he can do in us. Amen? There's a lot he can do. Um, in, uh, I guess I didn't get this slide in. Um, if you turn to James chapter 4, I can't believe it. I, I distinctly remember putting the slide in and it's not there somehow. Um, James chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 6 and 10. James chapter 4, verses 6 and 10. It says here, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Amen? And then verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will what? He will lift you up. So, so we have to remember that when God, God is not trying to, to bash on our self-esteem when he tells us that we need to come to him humble, right? When we need to come to him emptying ourselves of self, right? He's not trying to take away our self-esteem, but what he's trying to do is help us to see that our true identity, our true self-esteem comes from our identity in him, from our relationship to him. So, so he's, it's, it's, it's not that, that he wants us to go beating ourselves up with whips. So, oh, I'm such a bad person, you know, because sometimes that can actually be false humility. You know that? Penance is a form of false humility introduced by the Catholic Church. But we aren't Catholic. But sometimes we act like it, right? Because when we try to beat ourselves, oh, I've been such a bad person. It's actually a form of pride. It's shame, right? Shame is like the other side of the coin of pride. Um, and, uh, and, and so it, it's, it's a way of, of trying to earn ourselves back into the good graces of God again. Oh, I'm such a horrible person. I deserve to be, you know, this and that. So, so that, that's not where God wants you to be either. When, when, when we say humble, doesn't mean you have to go around saying negative things about yourself. In fact, I would highly discourage you from doing that, right? What you should say to yourself are the promises of God. What you should be saying to yourself are the words that God uses to describe you. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased, right? 
And, and, and so we have to go through the Bible and find those verses that tell us who we are in Christ. Amen. That's what we should be doing. But that doesn't mean that we can do it on our own. No. God resists those who think they can do it on their own. That's what he says. I, he resists the prideful, but he gives grace to the humble, right? How many of us could use more grace? <laughs> right? But we're kind of working against ourselves. When we don't come to God and just say, God, this is who I am. You know, you think about the publican and the Pharisee. They were right next to each other, both in church. But they had two different soils in their heart. The Pharisee was growing his spiritual life in the soil of pride. And he was doing a lot of things. But he was missing the most important, which is the recognition that he needed God in his life. His focus was on all the things he was doing and on what everybody else was doing. The publican wasn't focused on what other people were doing. He wasn't even focused on what he was doing. He just says, oh, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, here I am. Can you do anything with me? I I'm giving myself to you. God gave him grace because he was humble, but he resisted the Pharisee because he was prideful. And so when you think about the Beatitudes, I, I, would, I would like to suggest to you that they are steps. They are steps. Not a 12-step program. No. Um, but, they, but there's a specific order to them. The Beatitudes are in a specific order. You cannot achieve the ones toward the bottom of the list until you have achieved the, the first ones on the list. So, like I said, it, it's like a ladder, right? There's progression there. And there's nothing wrong with that. Some people get uncomfortable when they think about this. Are you talking about works? No, remember what I said. If you're on the ladder, guess what? You're good. You're good, right? <laughs> The problem is when you think you don't need the ladder anymore and you can find your own method to getting to heaven. But when you're focused on Christ and you're following his steps, there's a blessing. That's why he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Every single step, there's a blessing attached to it. Amen? Amen? So it's not works in the sense of you're doing it on your own, but it is progression. And God is not against progression. The idea of something growing is progress. Amen? Amen. There's nothing in the Bible that would indicate that God wants you to stay right where you are just the way you are now. We're either growing or we're dying. There's not, there's not kind of this in-between, this frozen state of being in the, in the natural world and, and especially not in the, in the spiritual world. So God wants us to grow. And so there's nothing wrong with understanding that, that, uh, that there's progression in the Christian life. As long as we don't attach salvation to those who are on the higher end of the ladder versus those who are on the lower end. Because we know the danger in that. Jesus gave us many parables, especially the one with the workers in the vineyard, right? He said there were some workers who worked 12 hours, and there were others who worked what? One, but what did they all get in the end? The same, the wage, right? Because it wasn't by works. It was grace to be even allowed to be a worker. Grace was being called to be a worker in the vineyard. God didn't care how much you worked, how many grapes you picked. He just wanted you to go. 
and your acceptance of that, you're getting on that first round of the ladder, that's enough. That's enough. And so every step is grace. I love what Colossians chapter, actually, I think I have this one. Colossians. Oh. I had them backwards. All right. Now, now it makes more sense. Um, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Friends, think about that. I mean, before we keep going to that, as you have received Jesus, so walk in him, right? So it's, there's never a point in the journey where it stops being grace and starts becoming works, right? We receive the grace of God through faith, amen? Therefore, we also walk with Jesus by faith. Praise the Lord. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Friends, that's what God wants for you. So, so in a way, we can see that, that true faith and humility are, are one. There can be no humility without faith, and there can be no faith without humility. Everything rooted in faith is rooted in humility. One cannot say they have faith while at the same time holding on to pride. Those are mutually exclusive to one another. And again, evidence that we are lacking self-awareness. But when we take the leap of faith, admitting our lack, we become free to experience the life-giving power of grace and acceptance of a loving God. Um, I'm going to recommend to you over this series that you pick up um, the little book, Christ, uh, excuse me, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. Um, and there, there's a quote on the, the Beatitudes, page 8 and 9, that I want to share with you. It says, All who have a sense of their deep soul poverty who feel that they have nothing good in themselves, may find righteousness and strength by looking unto Jesus. He says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. He bids you, exchange your poverty for the riches of his grace. We are not worthy of God's love, but Christ, our surety, is worthy and is abundantly able to save all who shall come unto him. Whatever may have been your past experience, however discouraging your present circumstances, if you will come to Jesus just as you are, weak, helpless, and despairing, our compassionate Savior will meet you a great way off and will throw about you his arms of love and his robe of righteousness. I don't know what you may be struggling with right now, we all have a struggle. But I can guarantee you, I do know the solution. The solution is found in the beauty of becoming humble, right? Not just by admitting that we can't, but more importantly, by admitting that God can. There's nothing wrong with saying I can't as long as we follow it through with, but God can. God can. There's nothing magical about faith. It's simply believing that God is who he says he is. And that you are who he says you are. And that he will do what he said he will do. Right? It's really that simple. But it has to be in that order. God is God. I am his creation. Right? Therefore, I am dependent upon him for everything. And since I am dependent on him for everything, I can trust him to provide me with everything I need. 
because he said he would. And he has proven it over and over again. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Once you take that step, and it is a big step, but once you take it, the rest is possible. Not just possible, inevitable. So will you do it? Will you take the step of faith today, admitting that you're powerless, but God is powerful? That you are weak, but he is strong. That you are poor, but he is rich. Amen. That you are a sinner, but he is the righteous one who is willing to exchange it all if you just come to him today. Is that your desire, friend? Praise the Lord. Raise your hand with me. That's your desire. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this time we could spend today just reflecting on on the basics of our walk with you. Lord, I pray today that we were challenged to go back and look at our walk with you. Look at ourselves. Examine ourselves like your word of God tells us to do. See if we are walking with you or walking on our own. Lord, I pray that you will Open our eyes, as we sang today. Open our eyes so that we can see you. We can see you calling us. We can see you, your arms reaching out to us, willing to give us everything we need, Lord, if we would just admit that we need it. Lord, I admit it today, and I praise you for all those here who have done the same. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I invite our singers up. We're going to sing... Um, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. And if there's no words in the um, screen, you can find it in, the, uh, in your uh, songbook, in the hymnal. It's number 569. So uh, you can sing along that way. So we invite you to stand and join us for this closing song. Thank you that 
you never pass us by when we reach out to you, Lord, because you're always there, Lord. Watch us over us now as we leave this place until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.